that dynamic equilibrium and what we say here is non-equilibrium. of a system. And so when I look at this thing, this is what's directly connected to momentum. And if I was to give you an upshot, it looks something like this here. So I'm gonna summarize it for you right now. So the first thing here is that if x external is equal to zero, it's actually more appropriate to talk about impulse that we have in what are what is called an external impulse. But I haven't defined impulse, so I won't do that. So if I have an external force that's zero on the system, then what it says here, then the system is in dynamic equilibrium. And if it's in dynamic equilibrium, the system must adjust slash rearrange itself to keep the overall V center mass moving at a constant velocity. And you could see I am really, really trying to keep saying the same thing. The system must, must adjust, rearrange itself to keep the overall velocity center of mass fixed. And what you're going to see here is that this is how we're going to use it. The momentums of a system. So you're going to see that we're going to move from the word velocity center of mass to the momentums of a system. So the momentums of a system will adjust rearrange themselves to conserve V center mass. And so what you're going to see that in a system, I'm going to have a system. Okay. You're going to see that I could have a system here. And in this system, what you're going to find here is that I could have little billiard balls moving around. And what they're doing here is that these guys are literally colliding with each other. If the external force on this system is equal to zero, then what you're going to find here, however many you have here, that then the total momentum will be a constant. And it's because this total momentum is proportional to the velocity center of mass. That's what we're going for and part of it. And then there's a second piece. If F external is not equal to zero, then what you're going to see that the system is 
in a non equilibrium state. And if it's in a non equilibrium state here, then that system must have some of the particles accelerating. But I won't jump the gun here too much, but that's what essentially that, that we're gonna be looking at. So what I wanna do here is that to give a sense of what we're talking about, look how this is all about collisions. So we wanna focus on collisions here. So what we're gonna do here is that we're going to look at collisions within a system. Okay, so here I go. So if I'm gonna look at collisions, I'm just gonna label this section as collisions. So what is a collision? Collisions are complicated. There's a lot that goes on in collisions. So what I wanna do here is that I wanna I want to look at what we have so far. So what I want to imagine here is that I want to set up a simple system. So a simple collision between two objects looks something like this. So I could imagine that I have this, right? So if I'm looking at this thing here, what I imagine here is that I have two blocks. I have block number one. And so when I'm looking at block number one, we imagine that the block is moving to the right. And then I have a second block. And this block is moving the opposite direction and we see that these objects are going to collide. And what you, we're gonna see here is that there's gonna be three total stages here. There's the before the collision. And then what we're gonna see here is that these objects will collide. So in other words, I'm gonna have a collision with this guy right here and this guy, right? So these, there's a collision between one and two and typically in physics, we call it an interaction. And then afterwards, then we have, let's say objects may be moving along this direction here. So if I'm looking at these objects, you know, depending on their masses and their velocities, et cetera, here, we may have a situation where these guys are actually moving in opposite direction. Does it have to be this way? Of course it doesn't. But for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to abbreviate this thing to make it nice and clean. And so there's after. So what do we know about this thing here? Well, we could say the following thing here. Suppose that we have a closed system, okay? We have a closed system. And if I have a closed system, there is a collision. So if there is a collision, then what we could say here is that in, when they collide, if it's really within the system, then we know that these forces are gonna do what? They're gonna be equal and opposite and that collision will not affect the system. And so then after the center of mass velocity of before and after must be the same. And that's a surprising feature here, right? So what this is telling us here is that before and after the collision, all we know is that V center of mass and this situation must be a constant in 
all collisions. Now you'll see here is that we can relax this a little bit and we'll talk about this, relax uh, this assumption and we'll talk about it a little bit later because the vast majority of the time you're gonna find that the force of the collision will usually be much, much bigger than any other force. Like for example, like the force of friction. So if you look at the force of the collision and you're including friction, you'll see that friction will be just overshadowed by this thing. And so that you could approximate this to a very high degree. And what, what I'm gonna show you here is that there are three classes of collisions where the center of mass is a constant, dynamic equilibrium. What we said here is that if I have a system and the net force on that system, that is the external forces on that system are zero, then that's just like back in chapters five and six, the system is in equilibrium. It's either in static equilibrium where the center of mass of the position does not change before and after any kind of interaction because it's an internal force that's, that can't change it. And then the other thing that we're doing now is we're saying that if it's in dynamic equilibrium, then we know that the velocity of the center mass must be a constant. So let's just review this and then let's get going. So I said that in summary, if the net, if the external forces on the system is zero, you're gonna see it's not really an external force. It's something called an external impulse. Then the system is in dynamic equilibrium. What does that mean? The system must adjust slash rearrange itself to keep the overall center of mass of velocity remaining a constant. And I'll show you some videos excuse me, some simulations later on that do that. But in the language of this chapter, one of the key things of this chapter is of course, momentum. This statement is about momentum. And so the momentums of the system will adjust, rearrange themselves to conserve the center of mass. And that total momentum is proportional to V center of mass. It's a systemic thing. If the external force is not zero, then the system is a non-equilibrium state and non-equilibrium state from Newton's laws tells us about that the system must be accelerating. Newton's laws are not fundamental. Momentum is fundamental. And what we're gonna find here is that when we say a system is in a non-equilibrium state, we say that the momentum changes. That's where we're headed. Even though I haven't defined momentum yet, that's exactly what I'm saying. So the way we typically look at mom momentum here is that we look at it from the language of collisions. And collisions essentially come in three flavors, if I could say that. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at our first one. So the first one that we wanna look at here is we wanna look at what I call standard collisions. Now, why do I call them standard collisions? Just because I didn't have any better way of saying it. And one really clear example is that what, you're, what I'm gonna show you here is that I wanna look at a simple collision. I wanna look at a collision between a baseball and a bat. So what I'm really looking at that, when I'm looking at these collisions here, I could imagine that I have the end of the bat, then of course the bat then gets bigger. And what you're really doing is that you're really seeing this from the front, okay? So this right here is the the end of the bat, okay, here's a bat. And what you're finding here is that when I'm looking at my system, here's what I'm seeing. 
I know the bat is moving, and at the same time, I know that there's a baseball coming in. So when I'm looking at this baseball, we're seeing that it's actually moving towards the bat at the same time. So this here is our baseball. So what's our system? Well, our system is going to be the bat baseball. And if this is my system here, here's what we find here is that the collision between the baseball and the bat, right? So what we say here is that the collision between the baseball and bat are internal to the system. So that implies immediately, right? That implies immediately that V center of mass initially must be V center of mass and the final situation, you know, and, and a lot of the times you'll see me write V center of mass before equals V center of mass after the collision. It doesn't change, right? That's a really powerful statement because of that. And so even though I talked about a baseball bat situation, check it out. There's lots of collisions like that. And what you're seeing here in this picture here, look at the collision between the tennis ball and a racket or a golf ball and a golf club or a softball and a bat. All of these types of things conserve the center of mass because in those collisions, it's an internal force that's actually being done and internal forces do not change the center of mass of that system here. And like I said before, we'll get to that. There's another kind of collision and, and, the, and it's really about looking again at the center of mass of the system, which is kind of crazy. This is one of my favorite of the collisions actually, believe it or not. This, is, this has so much beautiful physics here. This is a gravity assist collision. So this type of collision literally has two objects where they interact and Newton's third law really applies the force on each other. So what you're gonna find here is that here's what's really surprising about this. What you could have, so gravity assist Oops, gravy, that's a nice one. Gravity assist is when a rocket gains speed after interacting with a, let's say a planet or a moon. So what I have here is that imagine that I have a rocket. Okay, so here's my rocket. So here's my rocket. So if I consider you have your lime green rocket. And of course, this rocket is going through space like this, right? And what you're finding here is that this rocket is actually going to interact with the planet. Okay, so you can imagine that maybe I have a blue planet here. So when I look at my system, here's my rocket, here's my planet, and then I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna say, okay, here's my system now. Right, here's my system. What's really surprising here is that if I look at this from the interaction of just work, right, just to make sure, right, we're talking about my system. So everything that I'm talking about is that interact, any, any interaction between the rocket and the planet is an internal force. So the center of mass 
the velocity center of mass must be the same. By the way, I forgot to tell you that the planet is moving, of course, because if you're talking about here in the solar system, all planets are moving. So here's what's crazy about this thing here. Think about what's happening here. Well, I gotta be really careful here because I gotta label the velocities. Every planet has a force of gravity. So let's think about this. So check this out. This tells me that there's a force of gravity on the planet that's pulling on the rocket. And because there's displacement, you could see that the work of the planet is gonna increase the speed of the rocket. And then afterwards, look what happens. So this is what happens here. So that if I was to say here is that as rocket approaches planet, the work of the planet is positive and therefore increases kinetic energy of rocket. But then look what happens as the rocket leaves now. So now if I was to look at the situation a little bit later here, right? I could draw it like this, right? Here we go. And then I have my rocket again. Let's go draw my rocket. And so when I'm looking at my rocket here, what you're seeing here is that now as the rocket is leaving, look at what the planet is doing now. It's applying a force of gravity in that direction while the displacement is here. So then the work of the planet is negative. So therefore it decreases the kinetic energy of the rocket. But here's the crazy thing about that when you're looking at the system here. The crazy thing is that the increase in kinetic energy is larger than the decrease in kinetic energy. So what you're seeing here is that the overall speed results in, in the increase in speed of the rocket. Man, so even though I, I should not draw it this way because it is not correct. So remember what I'm saying. What I'm gonna draw right now is not correct. But let's say that it, it, it's a representation of what actually happens. So look what happens here. The rocket comes in initially slower. So let's think about that. So here's my rocket. Okay, so this is gonna be my velocity of the rocket. Okay. And then what you're gonna find here is that afterwards, look what happens. The rocket increases speed overall. But you can't get something from nothing. So what you find here is that essentially what we're really looking at is we're looking at this. What you're seeing here is that if I was to say how do I say this? I got to draw a different picture. Let's say that this is the speed of the planet. Okay, this is the speed of the planet. What happens here is that if I compare both situations here, that the reason why the rocket gains speed is because the planet actually lost speed, which is a really crazy idea. 
So the rocket comes in slower, it leaves faster, but the planet actually is slower after. And what you find here is that this is what happens here, is that because the mass of the rocket is so huge, you can't even tell that it's slowed down. It only slowed down by a tiny, tiny microscopic value. But the rocket having such a small mass ends up gaining a lot of speed. And this is exactly what, you know, JPL actually uses. So if you look at, uh, so this is a, a JPL image um, of the Cassini probe. So check this out. The image is not beautiful. Okay. I, I need to get a better image. I remember looking at one point, but it didn't really work out. So I'm going to put this over here. So here's the JPL image of the Cassini probe. So the Cassini probe was to go to Saturn here. And you could see that it's very blurry. So I'm going to try to help you and try to actually see here. So here's where it starts at right here. So this point right here is where it starts. Okay. So what happens now is that the rocket from Earth takes off. So here's the path. So I'm going to make this a little bit thicker here. So what it does here is it goes into deep space. And then what it does here is that it's going to come around here. And look at what happens here. So first of all, note that this is the sun. In case you didn't, I didn't really stress that, that guy right there is the sun. And what you're seeing here is that the first thing that it does here is it goes by Venus. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say, here's the planet Venus right there. So this planet right here is Venus. And then what it does is it does a flyby by Venus. And what does it do? The rocket increases speed. So here it comes again. So it's now going faster here. And then what it does here is it swings, it, it swings around, but the earth has already moved. So it's coming and then it comes back again. And then guess what it does? It swings by Venus again. And then the next thing that it does is it swings by earth. So it's actually swinging by three planets, two Venuses, one earth, and then what it does here is it now has dramatically increased its speed. And then it's launched out into space here. So it comes out into space. And then look what it does. It swings by Jupiter now. Jupiter's right there. And it swings by Jupiter. And so now it uses all of this increase in kinetic energy to actually get all the way into Venus here. Dude, those people like JPL, you got to admit, they're badasses, dude. Imagine what they had to go through to actually do all this calculation to figure out how the planets are going to just line up just right for this thing. Incredible. So the question might be, why can't we just load up the rocket with enough fuel. To get to Saturn. And the answer is real simple. You can't. The load would be so massive that you wouldn't be able to get it off. You, would, you wouldn't escape the Earth's gravity. You, you just can't. You just can't. That's why they have to use gravity assist. But you can see that that's a radically different collision. These guys are not um, like collision like we were talking about before. But you know what's the special thing about this thing? This is what's special. If this is V center of mass, guess what? 
you have B center of mass, that's exactly the same because that's an interaction where that's internal. And that if that's internal, then that, that's the way it is, okay? There's another quite different type of collision. And this is probably for selfish reasons why I'm telling you this one. We will never do anything like this. And th these are called particle collisions. And particle collisions are without any doubt the most bizarre of all of them. So what you find here is that if you look at a place sort of like the CERN, CERN does not use matter and antimatter. They use, they use, they collide two protons together. But before CERN, people used to have matter and antimatter collisions. So an example of this would be the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. And what they do here is that they do the following thing. They have a glob of matter, okay? So you could imagine that this is a piece of matter. And the question is, what do we mean by matter, right? What is matter? Well, if you look at technically what matter is, is that there's a very strict definition of what matter is. Matter is about these things called quantum numbers. So if you wanted to describe what a quantum number is, it's essentially characteristics of an object. Like for example, we may have somebody tall, dark, and handsome, Let's say that's Othello. So that means he has dark hair, he has dark skin, he's tall. And so when we look at him, we say those are his characteristics. When we look at quantum particles, they have quantum number. They have, they have mass, they have things called spin, they have charge, et cetera, like this. There is another thing called antimatter. Now, what's special about antimatter? Antimatter has the opposite quantum numbers. So for example, if I take an electron, an electron has a negative one charge. If I take the antimatter of an electron, it would have a positive charge. That's what we call a positron. If you look at an electron, it has a quantity called spin that's one half. If you look at an anti-electron, it would have a spin of minus one half. So they're, they're opposite. And so what you're finding here is that when you look at these things, if I take a piece of matter and antimatter, and then I throw them at each other, okay? So if I throw them at each other, what you find here is that if I have equal amounts of matter and antimatter, uh, things with opposite um, quantum numbers, something really special happens. When these things collide, you get pure radiant energy. That means these guys completely annihilate each other, okay? And what you get here is you get nothing but pure energy. Okay, but wait a minute. Guess what? Here's my system. These collisions are internal to the system. So you know what's special about this thing? It turns out that B center of mass before equals V center of mass afterwards because it's an internal force. And what you find here is that it turns out that it's more complicated now because we can't apply this type of thinking that we're doing to do that. And so what we have to do here is that we have to go 
to a more robust system where Newton's laws or mechanics, as we call it, is embedded. And it's embedded into a theory known as special theory of relativity here. And you probably have heard of, well, I mean, what's the most famous equation of all time, right? It has to be E equals MC squared. Well, it turns out that E equals MC squared is an incomplete statement. It's like trying to talk about kinetic energy or something like that without talking about total energy. So it turns out that from special relativity, a new energy expression comes up. And it's because it's more complicated. And it looks like this here. It says energy squared. And then there's thing, something called PC squared plus MC squared squared. This is the only way that you should look at MC squared. And so here's the crazy thing. This is energy. This is really more like a form of kinetic energy. And MC squared is really a term of potential energy. So this is really a potential energy and we call this mass potential. And here's the crazy thing. So the particles that come in and get converted into pure energy, the particles that come out are different. So the incoming particles are different than the outgoing ones. So these particles have literally changed their identity, but it doesn't matter. They still must follow V center of mass before equals V center of mass afterwards because it's internal. And so particle accelerators are the, are the objects that actually send these things at each other. And then particle detectors actually show the collision. Now, this is not a real collision here. This is an image of a collision that some artist created. But here's the thing. Check this out. Here's a particle. This will be my matter particle. And then check this out. Here's my antimatter particle. And when they collide, they create this pure radiant energy, and because of energy and mass being proportional to each other, brand new particles that are massive can come out. And you got to admit, that is quite radically different than a collision that you would think about. But they all have the same characteristics. So what I want to do now is that I want to go in, now that we're done with collisions, because ultimately, what do we got to talk about? We got to talk about V center of mass being a constant. And one of the things that I said here is that it's customary to not talk about V center of mass, even though that's the most important thing here. We change the language into momentum. 